It's nice to see you. Happy New Year. It's 2023. Who would have thought? Um, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to do this yet. But what did God teach you in 2022? What did you learn from God in 2022 as you went through life, as you've reflected on the year? What is it that he said, hey, this is, these are some of the things as Harry, Harry prayed for, that some of the things that I've revealed to you about myself or some of the things that I've revealed to you about yourself or some of the things I've revealed to you about the world around you. I want to share with you a few things that God has taught me. And uh, to kind of begin that journey, we've got to go back a little bit before 2022. Like most of you, I was born at a young age and um, grew up in well, sometime next year. Some, that, one, that one might sink in as well for some of you. Um, born in Hong Kong and uh, grew up in Hong Kong for the first 10 years of my life. Uh, Mum and dad were working over there and my brother and I were both born over there. And if you've been to Hong Kong, there's one thing that you'll probably recognize and that's that there's not a lot of grass. There's a fair bit of concrete. Um, there's quite a bit of concrete but not much grass. And so for us to play any kind of sport, we couldn't go down to the oval because there was no oval. There was, a, there was a patch of grass where we lived, which was probably oh, maybe half this stage. But most grass in Hong Kong has a sign on it that says, stay off the grass, which is ironic. Um, it looks really good though. It's the best looking grass you'll ever see. But because of that, we played sport in the car park. So we had a multi-level story car park underneath where we lived and that was where we played I lived with a bunch of Americans so that was where we played baseball we played soccer we played basketball uh, we rode our bikes our skateboards everything happened on concrete and that didn't deter us because I loved playing sport sport was fun and so it was a good chance just to run around have some fun everyone would invariably end up with multiple scrapes, things bleeding, because if you fall on concrete, yeah, it's not very forgiving. But that was life, and it was good. When I turned about 10 years old, we came back to Australia. And in Australia, you've, we've got this stuff called grass, and it's everywhere. And it's green in winter, and it's brown in summer. But it's fun, and it's good. And if you fall over, you're OK. You just get back up, and you brush it off, and you keep going. So it was so good for me to come back to Australia, where in primary school, we could play sport all the time, and it was, it was awesome. So I got introduced a little bit more to cricket and footy and a whole bunch of other sports, and for me, that was just, that was life. Got to high school, and in high school, that continued. Loved playing tennis as well, but we were on a holiday one time, and it was Easter, and we're up, at, um, up on the Sunshine Coast. If any of you have been to the Sunshine Coast, beautiful spot. And we were there, and I wasn't feeling too well. Um, <clears throat> so I, my parents are doctors, and if you had the privilege of growing up with parents as doctors, you'd know that basically if you feel unwell, they say, have a drink of water and lie down. That's kind of the, the professional advice you get as a child. So I had my drink of water and I laid down. Uh, it didn't really help. <clears throat> Things got a little bit worse. And they said, oh, look, we probably should, we're probably at the point where we should take you to the hospital. Now, if your parents aren't doctors, that point comes a lot sooner. But when your parents are doctors, they're kind of, yeah, oh, you're fine, you're fine. Okay, yeah, we probably should take you now. So I went to hospital and um, had the tests and all, that, all those things done, and they couldn't actually find out what was wrong. As a part of that testing, though, they did discover that my kidneys weren't working as well as they should be. And so we went and saw a nephrologist, kidney specialist, and this guy did his more tests, and he basically said, yeah, you've got some kidney issues, just come back and see me next year, we'll do more blood tests. And that was that. So life continued, and... So Grace, my clicker's not working. Can you just move us through to the next picture? Um, <clears throat> this is me in high school, uh, in the middle, in case you couldn't notice. This was when I wore contacts. 
instead of glasses because glasses and sport don't tend to mix too well. We, we had a touch football team and my friend's dad worked for Pfizer at the time. So that's why we were sponsored by a um, worming medication. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> given, given what else Pfizer was producing at the time, this is probably a better option. Uh, <laughs> But I kept playing sport as per normal. Life continued. It was, it was good. Um, I, I loved being a part of school, sport, church, um, family. Everything was, everything was really good. In the meantime, I kept going back to see my nephrologist every year. He'd take his blood tests. He'd tell me, yeah, things are fine. Just come and see me next year. It didn't impact me at all. I didn't feel any different. Um, I thought this would just be something I had to do because... They just want to make sure, but it wouldn't really impact anything. And that kind of continued. We finished school, went to uni. Um, I, I did business originally and then worked in banking and finance for a little bit. Please don't hold that against me. And then, yeah, God tapped on the shoulder and said, I want you to do something else. I was involved in a church plant at the time and was really loving it. And it was really cool to see just the way that God works in people's lives and to be on the front line of that and seeing how when someone gets to understand who Jesus is and gets to know him, um, the impact that has on them and, and the change that it makes in their life. And so discipleship was something that I loved and God kind of kept tapping me on the shoulder saying, I want you to make a shift here, make a change. And I ignored it for as long as I could, and then um, it kind of got too strong. And so I accepted it and went to college and did ministry. And my first, first job out of college was down here in Melbourne. So moving into state, I had to find a new nephrologist. And I found um, at the moment, at the time I was living in Dandenong. Um, and so I had a nephrologist there, Dr. Wood. And he was a nice guy. And... At this point, I was just continuing to rock up to my yearly tests because that's what I was told to do. What I was doing, because I'm a bit of a nerd, was I was tracking my results. So this is um, <clears throat> one of the measures of kidney function is called EGFR. It's basically how your kidneys, how well your kidneys are filtering and Basically, anything over 85 in that green zone is a good spot. Um, so mine was, yeah, you know, it wasn't, wasn't terrible, wasn't the best, but I still felt fine. I was doing everything I loved doing. It didn't impact how I lived, how I moved, what I did. So it was kind of a, not that big a deal for me. And as I was tracking it, I remember asking him, so when does this actually become a thing? Because at the moment, it's pretty, pretty normal. It's not impacting me at all. And he said, look, it's not until you get around 10 to 15 that we probably need to start doing things. So once again, being the little nerd that I am, I thought, okay, well, let's extrapolate this out. Let's figure out what that's going to be at. And based on kind of my calculations, it was somewhere over here. Um, around 2030, 2035, that's when you might have to start doing something. You kind of expect life to go um, like that. And I, I don't think I was naive. Maybe I was, I'm not sure. But um, if you live long enough, you realize that life's probably a little bit more like that. There's, there's no straight lines. There's no, this is where I am, this is where things will probably end up. Okay, we can track that nicely. Things happen. Life throws at you curveballs that you don't expect. And you find yourself sometimes in situations where you, you never thought you would be here. You didn't plan on being here. You didn't want to be here. But yet here you are. And it's a surprise to us but it's not a surprise to God. He knew where things were going. He knew where things were tracking for me, for you. And, and as a result, he's not surprised by finding you in the situation that you're in. 
And that can be, that can be good news. So <clears throat> my results kind of <clears throat> continued to head in the general direction. But around, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> yeah, probably ar around five years ago, I remember I was with Dr. Wood, <clears throat> and he said, so your kidney disease is progressing. And that kind of woke me up a little bit, because this is the first time anyone had actually referred to what I had. I thought my kidney just wasn't working properly. But he gave it a name, and he, he, he gave it a label, and he, he kind of defined it in a way that previously it hadn't been defined for me. And so that's when my question started, well, what does this mean? How's it going to pan out? Is it, is it curable? No. Is it treatable? Yes. So what does the treatment look like? Now, I'd been on some minor medications for about 20 years, so that wasn't a big deal. I thought, oh, we'll just take some meds and maybe that'll fix it. He said, well, at the end of the day, you can treat it in two ways. You can treat it with dialysis or you can treat it with a kidney transplant. And I thought, okay, that wasn't quite how I thought this would pan out. I thought, you know, this would just be something I kind of manage throughout life and then, at, yeah, keep going to my doctor and keep getting checkups and then at, at some point, you know, I'd be in my ripe old age and fall asleep and, in my, fall asleep and that would be it. Um, <clears throat> but all of a sudden, he'd, he'd painted this in a new light and things looked different to what I thought they would look like. And we were now getting to the point where we were heading towards that 10 to 15 mark. This is about, um, yeah, 2021, as you can see. And I had to reconcile that with, all right, God, what, what were you planning on doing here? What's your play in all of this? How are you, how are you going to pan out? How are you going to step into all of this situation and and do something. Because when you're, when you're confronted with a situation that you didn't expect to find yourself in, it can cause you to start thinking about, all right, what's God like? Because sometimes we see God as though, if I, if I do what you tell me to do, and I pray, I turn up, and I subconsciously tick all these boxes that I think I should be ticking, then the promise is that you will bless. Now, I know maybe on the surface level, we don't believe that. But when you find yourself in a situation that you didn't expect yourself to be in, you start wondering, okay, God, you're good. I'm sure you're good. Why, why is this now happening here? And that, that thought process can be a bit of a, a rabbit hole because it leads to this belief that if I do the right things, God also will meet me here. If I do these things, God will come to the party and it becomes this kind of transactional relationship where when something doesn't go wrong, you wonder, okay, God hasn't come to the party, so maybe I'm not doing something right here. And it's, it's this strange view of God. And I had to wrestle with this and think about this and go, is that, is that really the kind of God that I believe he is? Is God this transactional being who responds to me when I respond to him in a certain way? Or is God a little different to maybe what I previously thought? Around this time, I was, yeah, thinking about how this would all pan out, what it would mean, what it would look like. And there was this, seems to be the theme of the day, there was this song that I was um, <clears throat> listening to. And, and the lyrics seemed to be really, really relevant. I, I don't know, God is amazing. He pops songs into your life, for me anyhow, maybe for you as well, just at the time when you seem to need them. And this one, the lyrics went like this. How long will I give myself before I give up waiting? How long will I have to hide behind this smile that says that I'm okay? 
How long will I hold on to the promise that I thought I heard you speak when every passing day just leaves me broken down and weak? you resonate with that? But then it goes on to say this. How long is it going to take? As long as it takes for my heart to find its song. As long as it takes to know that I'm still not alone. At the end of the day, I'll stand right here and say, I know that you love me, miracle or not. And one of the things God has taught me is that he loves me, whether he decides to step in and do a miracle or if he doesn't. Because when you're in that place where you didn't expect to find yourself and you're wondering, hey, God, how's this going to pan out? There may be a miracle, but there may not. But that doesn't, matter. that doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. That doesn't mean that his presence is not there. That doesn't mean that there is this, this huge eternal picture that we see one tiny little bit of. It just means that we are where we are. But God still loves you, whether he comes through with a miracle or not, because he's not a transactional God. And there's more to this than, some, than often we see. Okay, let's move into actual last year. March 9. I had... Um, actually, no, let's, let's step back a little bit before that. Um, around uh, March of the previous year, 2021, I was um, talking to my doctor and he said, look, it's time that we actually transfer you to... Um, the transplant clinic, transplant and dialysis clinic at Box Hill. So I was like, okay, um, what, is, what does that mean? He says, well, you go to them and they will start working you up to get you ready for dialysis. And they will, at the same time, they'll also start the process of trying to prepare you for a transplant. Now, this was, um, <clears throat> this was something I'd heard about but I didn't know any of the details of how it all worked. And so I said, okay, so what does, what does it look like when um, I need to actually get a transplant? How, like, how does that process work? And they said, well, there's a few ways you can do it. You can, um, <clears throat> you can go on a waiting list. Um, you can't go on the waiting list until you start dialysis, but that waiting list is for a deceased kidney. So if someone who is registered as an organ donor passes away and their kidney is viable, then if you are next in line, then you get that. I was like, okay, so how long is the wait list? They said, look, it's, it's on average, it's about three to five years. All right, so that's one option. What's another option? Well, the other option is that you see if there's anyone who would be willing to donate. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. How does that conversation go? Hey, how you going? Have you got a good kidney? Okay, can we, <laughs> can we talk? Um, I, it's, a, it's an awkward conversation to have on several levels. One, how do you ask someone to go through a major operation, give up an organ that they may need later on, um, just because they can? But it's also an awkward conversation because you have to ask someone for help. And you, you have to recognize that, I had to recognize that I was at a point where there was absolutely nothing I could do about this. And for someone who likes being in control, yeah, that's not a pleasant place to be. But there was, there was zero impact I could really have on how this would pan out. And that, that leaves you in a place where you, you realize that my options are either to ask for help or to stay silent and have no idea how this will end or when it will end. And in a way, <clears throat> it's kind of liberating because when you have nothing else that you can offer, it's, it, it's a space where you realize I can fully let go of all of this. I can relinquish all control. I can let go, go of all sense that I, I had some kind of play on how this would pan out. And you can just say, all right, what, what's going to happen here, God? And that was where I was at. 
And in, in some ways, it was liberating because it kind of reframed my relationship with God. Because at the end of the day, that's what we ought to do, isn't it? Like, we all have to be in this place where, God, I don't have control over any of this. Both maybe in a, on a personal level with what's happening in life, but also in terms of eternity, I don't have any say in being perfect because I'm not. I, I don't have any other option that I can go to apart from the fact that I've stuffed up, I've got nothing I can offer, and all I can say is, God, this is all you. And so it was kind of, as I said, liberating to be at that point. So I'd started dialysis, and this was March of, of this year, of last year, sorry. Um, but this was another instance of where I could not do anything. I just had to go, I had to rock up. The nurses told me what to do, how to do it, um, and I went for the option of PD or peritoneal dialysis, which is where you have a little catheter in here and you plug in bags and the bags drain in and they drain out of the fluid and then you dra drain it out at the end of the day. Um, <clears throat> and so this is what I was doing, completely reliant on other people, on other processes and other systems, um, on the medicine, but also from a personal perspective, I was getting tired, I was getting weary, and there was things that I previously I would have done in my sleep that now I just, I just couldn't do. And I started to have to realize that I needed to accept help. And I, I don't know about you, but you might be really willing to, hey, I'm, I'll help you out, I'll drop anything and come and help you, I'll be there for you, I'll do whatever you need. But when it comes to actually needing help for ourselves, it can be really hard to ask for it. Um, <clears throat> But I realized that if I wasn't willing to accept the help that people were offering or ask for it, really what I was doing was I was preventing people from doing what God had prompted them to do. <laughs> if God had tapped someone on the shoulder and said, hey, I want you to go and do this for the Catons, when I say no, hey, we're okay, thanks, we're fine, we're all good, I'm actually stopping, trying to stop God from what he's trying to do. And I'm preventing that person from, from being a blessing and being blessed by what they've done. And so accepting help is not being a burden. Asking for help is not being a burden. It's actually a way of building trust, of building community, of being blessed by what other people can do. That was another thing God taught me. Jump forward a little bit. I had, to, um, I had to figure out which option I was going to take for transplant. Dialysis was happening, and I asked, um, I, yeah, I have prayed about it, and I, I thought about it, and I agonized over it, and I finally picked up the phone and um, called one of my friends. See, I was calling him because... Um, some of my family had been tested and they, they weren't matches. So I called my friend Brad and we've known each other for 25 years. And I said, uh, so I've got an awkward question to ask you. It's a bit odd, feel free to say no, but would you just be willing to get tested to see if you might be a match? And I was ready for, okay, he's, yeah. He's going to say, look, yeah, no, look, really understand what you're going through and it's tough and, and uh, I get all that. Um, yeah, let me have a think about it and I'll get back to you. I asked him the question. He said, yeah, sure. And once again, blown away by someone's willingness to help. He got tested and the process is pretty lengthy. He got poked and jabbed and had lots of blood taken from him. Every time he went for a blood test, he's like, man, how much are you guys going to take? And they, they did these tests on him. And in December 2021, we were on holiday in Inverloch for a few days and got a phone call from the, the transplant nurse. And she said, look, at a preliminary level, it looks like Brad might be a match. 
It's like, okay, we did not expect that to happen. Um, <clears throat> and so I remember Jules and I were there and we got the news and we were excited, we were crying, we were going, yes, couldn't imagine that this would have happened this way. About three weeks later, I got another phone call, this time from the, um, the head nephrologist. And he said, look, we, we did a bit more testing on Brad and we actually don't think he's a match. Because um, there's multiple layers of, of testing and levels of trying to match things up. And he said, look, we could do it, but it's probably not the best option. I was like, okay, so what happens next? And he said, look, we can do, with, there's something called the kidney exchange program. Now, my best way of explaining this is kind of like match.com for people with kidney disease. <laughs> it's basically, I've, I've got someone who's willing to donate to me. Someone else has someone who's willing to donate to them, but they're not a match and we're not a match. But it just so happens that they're a match for me and my donor's a match for them. So there's this massive database that they put everyone in and it's continually crunching through. And they said, we'll put you in the database and we will look for, um, we'll see what jumps out. Said so it, it can take a while, but we'll, while we're doing that, we'll continue going through a testing process with other potential donors and we'll see how it goes. So um, <clears throat> we're going through that process and I got a phone call one day this is um, in 2021, and it was my nephrologist, and he said, we think we found a match on the kidney exchange program. I'm like, okay, that sounds good. How, how good is it? And he said, look, you're probably not going to get one better than this. Um, it, it's a really good match. It's a guy in his um, late 50s. Um, he's, he's a large guy, so he should get a large kidney. That's good. Um, but it looks like it's all going to suit really well. And I was like, well, so what happens now? He says, well, you basically just have to work out whether you want to go ahead. I'm like, yes, I, I don't know. Um, so I, I rang Brad and said, hey, Brad, they think they got a match. Are you happy to go ahead? He, he said, let's do it. This is great. So I called the nephrologist back and said, yeah, well, let's make it happen. And so things happened pretty quickly from there. Um, they, they booked it in and they did some final testing and this here on the left hand side, that's me and Julie leaving for the hospital on April 6th and it's strange being in hospital when you feel okay. Um, that's Brad and I eating a meal on April 6th. The plan was to go in early April 7 and Brad would have his kidney taken out at the same time as the other donor, which we found out was in Sydney. And they, they both went in at eight o'clock in the morning and they both go under at exactly the same time. So like there's someone on the phone coordinating for when they go under so no one can back out and someone be caught. Um, it, yeah, it's a fascinating process. So they go under at the same time, Brad's kidney um, gets taken out, the donor's kidney gets taken out, Brad's kidney goes into a, an esky and gets put, put on a plane. The donor's kidney, same thing. Now, I thought, if, I've watched, if you've watched any medical shows, yeah, you're like, yeah, police car, sirens, rocking up at the plane on the tarmac, someone running in, and um, they use Star Trek Express. Oh. Such an anticlimax. Like, I was, I was hoping for, like, this, yeah, really exciting thing happening. Um, but no, they use a courier. So the courier, um, Sydney, the courier picks it up. And uh, mean, meanwhile, I'm in the hospital and they said, you'll, you'll probably go in around 11 a.m. So around 10, 10 o'clock, 10.30, the transplant coordinator comes over and says, look, there's a few things happening, We're probably gonna push it back to one. Okay, like, yeah, that's cool. I've been waiting a while, so what's, what's two hours? One o'clock comes and she says, look, been a few delays. We're looking at probably three or four now. Yeah, it's fine. I'm not worried. I'm not panicking at this time. Everything's fine. 
Around 3.30, she comes back in. She says, all right, let me tell you what's happened. And she proceeded to explain that my kidney had missed the flight. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, yeah, so far removed from the TV series. Like, it, nothing like it. And I said, okay. And she was, she was like both embarrassed. I was laughing. She was embarrassed. <laughs> then she started laughing and it was all good. But um, I said, okay, so what happens next? I said, well, it's, it's got the next flight. It's got the next flight. Um, and so it will be arriving and we're probably looking at 8, 9, 10 o'clock tonight. Like, yeah, that's fine. It's going ahead. That's what matters. So come around, um, yeah, 10 o'clock. She came back in and said, good news. We have a kidney. It's arrived. It's downstairs. We're, we're ready to go. Someone will be up and we'll take you down shortly. So they took me down. And by this time, the hospital is empty. Not empty, but you know, the general day staff have gone. It's quiet. And down in the, um, the pre-op room, it's... it's the lights are low, there's no one else around. And God just filled that space with this massive sense of calm. And it was just, it was quiet, it was still. And there was just this, I, I wasn't, yeah, I wasn't worried, I wasn't stressed. It was just, hey God, you've brought us this far. You, you can do the rest. Um, I know that you love me, miracle or not, right? So, The transplant went in, I woke up groggy in recovery. I was the only one there and the nurse said, yeah, it went really well. Um, things, things went really well. And this was the next day, Julie came and saw me. You can see that I was, um, yeah, still dealing with the general anesthetic there. <laughs> I had my cool little button that you could press to help with the pain. And the next few days, the next few weeks really were all about lots of blood tests, lots of medication, and starting the process of healing from the actual surgery site. Part of the blood tests um, were to see how my kidney function was going. And this is what it was leading up to it. Oh, you just see it. Um, and this was the day after. Um, I was back in the realm of a normal person with healthy functioning kidneys. Um, and I saw that and I was just blown away. Um, for so many reasons. For, for the fact that it worked. For the fact that someone was willing to give up a kidney so that I could have a second chance. For the fact that um, despite all the all the potential things that could have gone wrong. Um, you know, the kidney not fitting, um, the plumbing not working out, getting an infection, um, the surgeon sneezing mid-slice, mid, you know, mid you know, a whole bunch of things that could have happened. I was there. I had a kidney that was working. Um, and God, yeah, it seems... To me, like this time, he'd, he'd come through with something that was bigger than anything I could have ever expected. And so it taught me a few things. Yes, it taught me that I know that he loves me, miracle or not. It taught me that accepting help and asking for help is a beautiful thing. It taught me that life is precious. Um, and we all know that, and I know that, but sometimes you need reminders of just how true that is. That you don't know what's going to happen from one second to the next, but what you do have in this moment right now is precious. It's good. Hold on to it. It taught me that we need to drink lots of water. Um, they... They say a, hap a wet kidney is a happy kidney. So please drink lots of water. Unless you're on hemodialysis, in that case, don't drink much water at all. The 
The other thing it taught me, and this is probably more a practical thing if you're going into hospital, um, <laughs> be, be a bit preemptive with things. Um, the nurses were amazing. And, and I guess this points back to the, other, uh, the next thing I want to share with you, but um, they, would, they would come and they'd say, oh, I'm really sorry about this. I'm like, it's okay. And they would painstakingly, like, just little bits at a time, get water and saline. And they were incredibly thoughtful and caring um, in looking after me. But look, save yourself a lot of time and probably save the government a lot of money with all the time the nurses had to spend trying to pull these off carefully. <laughs> but this was the other thing that really stood out for me. There were nurses and doctors on that ward looking after me and all the others who'd received transplants or who were needing um, acute dialysis or were, were having, yeah, in the midst of kidney failure. There were people, myself and people on these wards, who these nurses went above and beyond to care for, who these doctors would, would come and check on regularly to make sure you're doing okay, who would be willing to pick things up off the floor when I tried to reach for it and couldn't, and then couldn't, bend, couldn't reach out across the bed to pick it up. Um, who would get you water or ice or anything you needed at any time of the day. And it showed me that whether these people believed in God or not, for me, it didn't matter because they were still revealing his kingdom to me. They were still showing what God's kingdom looks like even if they didn't know that they were doing that. And that was really cool to see. Not just, not just through them, but through the whole process from the church community, my family, extended family, friends. God seemed to just go, hey, Fraser, for this experience, I'm going to pull your eyes wide open and I'm going to let you see what my kingdom looks like. And you're going to see it from people who you did not expect would be revealing it. And that was really cool. So as you go through life, look for God's kingdom being revealed. And if you see it revealed from someone who you would not expect it to be revealed from, that is evidence of God's goodness showing through. And the final thing is this. Um, I've got some pretty cool scars around here. Um, and every now and then you get a twinge or a tweak and you feel it. And you have probably got scars too, different forms, shapes, sizes. But we often say scars, every scar tells a story, right? And yeah, they do. But if you believe in Jesus, the story isn't finished. So don't tell the story like it is. Yes, I have these scars and they are constant reminders of what God has done how he has provided, but they're also reminders of the fact that sometimes life is just no good and you get dealt things you don't want to be dealt and you have to face situations that you don't want to face and you find yourself in a place where you did not expect to see yourself. And whatever scars that produces, physical, emotional, relational, they will exist and they will stay for a time. Because every time I feel these, I, I think about the day when Jesus comes back. And when he comes back, the Bible says that those scars are going to be gone. That my natural kidneys, that are still there by the way, they leave them all in, um, they're going to be healed and uh, maybe I'll go to heaven with three kidneys. I don't know. But those scars will go and we'll get to heaven and we'll all be scar free and we will all be healed. We will be perfect. Our bodies will be restored to where they were originally supposed to be. And we'll be there with Jesus face to face. In the meantime, you and I, we're going to get more scars. It's, it's a fact of life. But there's this, another song, and the lyrics say, 
that when we think about what we're going through and we are worried about what scars that may produce or what pain that's going to bring or how we're going to get through it, to remember that the only scars in heaven are on the hands of the one who holds you now. Isn't that cool? The only scars we're going to see in heaven are going to be on Jesus' hands. Ours are going to be gone, but ours are going to be gone because he's been willing to take them on his hands himself. So I'm not sure what last year taught you, but I want to encourage you to take some time to think through it and think through, God, what have you revealed to me over the last year? Not just what have you revealed to me, but as a result of revealing that to me, as a result of the teaching that you have done in my life, how is that going to change the way that I live this year? How is that going to impact the way that I respond to other people? The way that I approach situations where I did not expect to find myself? How is that going to impact the way or the frequency that I ask for help? How is it going to impact the way that I see your kingdom being revealed around me? How is that going to impact the way that I treat other people? That I walk alongside them? How is that going to allow me to reveal your kingdom in unexpected ways to other people?